Welcome to this week's episode of the Madison Financial Tip Friday podcast with yours truly, Travis Goularte. In this week's episode, in the 907 Spotlight, I feature Mr. Kyle Kaiser. Kyle is a member of the IBEW, and he also started a nonprofit organization called Viper. And Viper is about helping U.S. service members transition from military life to civilian life and helping them get jobs. And he's partnered with some great organizations to help facilitate this transition period for, for ex-soldiers. Um, all around great dude. It's a great talk, great interview. Go ahead and let's take a listen to Kyle's talk about Viper and his path to success and how he got to where he's at today. So without further ado, here is my interview with Kyle Kaiser, the IBEW and the head of nonprofit organization, Viper. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, uh, Kyle, here on the 907 Financial Tip Friday podcast. Appreciate having you here. No, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Right on. So uh, let's let's give a little background about who you are and how you got to be where you're at. And we'll talk a little bit about the Viper program that you started. So where are you originally from? I am from Riverside, California. Well, I was born and raised in Chino on a dairy farm. Um, and then when I joined the military, that was the last time I lived in California. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want to go back and visit? Uh, I go back and visit my my uh, middle brother still lives in California, so we'll go back every now and then. But uh, no, I avoid it as much as I can. There's too, too, many, too many people for my taste now. And once you come to Alaska and you get kind of spread out, you're like, yeah, I, I like my space. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So you mentioned you were in the military. What branch were you in? I was in the army. I was a uh, uh, airborne infantry. Uh, then I went to sniper school after my Iraq deployment. Um, but yeah, airborne infantry, U.S. Army, right here in Fort Rich. Oh, all right, all right. I always love to hear the stories about uh, why people joined. I know for me, uh, I just happened to join my. I was between my junior and senior year in high school. My parents were out of town for two weeks, and me and my buddies were just partying up over at our house. And the recruiter called us up and. He's like, hey, why don't you guys all come down, you know? So we all go down there together after a few beers, you know. He's just sold us on this great story that we're going to join and go to basic together and AIT and we'll we'll get stationed together. I mean, we joined and I never saw any of those guys after. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what was it that got you to join? Uh, mine was uh, right during high school, you know, 9-11 happened and uh, uh, a bunch of my buddies ended up joining the military various branches. Most of them went Marine Corps uh, in Southern California. They all, all wanted to go to Pendleton. And, um, I ended up, I talked to the Marine recruiters and I talked to the air force recruiters and, and, um, and then I talked to the army recruiters and I, I liked the army cause I could pick, uh, my MOS and you know, I could pick my military skills. And uh, at the time I was young and angry and said, Hey, I want to jump out of planes, kicking doors and shoot the bad guy. Um, uh, and the recruiter kind of grinned and said, well, Hey, I got the, uh, got the perfect job for you. Hey, you ever thought about being infantry? And I was like, Oh yeah, that sounds good. And then you know, all the band of brothers clips and whatnot you're like oh yeah i'm gonna do that so um yeah but that was uh, i had lost a buddy of mine in the marine corps he, he had gotten deployed shortly after 9 11 and uh, when he passed um that was kind of the okay i need to do something with my life i was going to college um i was about oh gosh just just about done with my second year of college and uh it was kind of playing more than playing more than actually doing anything and then um, when I lost him, I was like, man, you know, I got to do, do something more, uh, with my life, but I had to deal with my parents. I wasn't going to join the military until I had a college degree. So as soon as I had all the credits for my associate's degree, I went to the recruiters and, and signed up and then came back and was like, Hey mom, dad, this is a staff sergeant Ward was the guy. I was like, I'm going to sign up. And they, uh, but, but you're in college. It's like, ah, I got my degree. And, and that's an associate's it's like oh you didn't say what degree you just said a degree so then i i went and enjoyed and that was that all right all right so you went off and joined the army uh where did you do basic at benning then yeah i did basic at uh fort benning and airborne school at fort benning uh and then i got stationed in the 501st uh, 501st blackfoot uh, uh, <laughs> apache <laughs> echo all the way man all right all right what year was that Oh gosh, I came up here in uh, 2005. First time to Alaska at that point? It was, it was. And so I had, I had uh, my recruiter done a good job and, and talked me into doing one of those uh, 18 X ray uh, special forces contracts where, oh you know, yeah, you're going to get a shot at being special ops. And you know, you're going, all right, it's just some like Bruce Willis, Tears of the Sun type stuff. This is what I want to do. Uh, yeah, well, the fine print is when you don't make it through selection, <laughs> you get to go needs of the army. And uh, my cousin, that I actually had 
no idea was in the military was a staff sergeant at the time and um when uh, the 18 extra contract went through and i was going to go need to the army uh, he came and found me he's like hey you're on orders to go to fort bragg or you can go up to fort rich in alaska um they have openings and i can get your orders changed what would you prefer and i was like well send me to alaska i'm never going to go to alaska on my own and um you know i was 19 years old and so like, yeah, let's do that. And I came up here and, um, man, the first, the first night I was here, uh, I saw a bull moose walk across the road, like 10 feet in front of the van I was riding in. And I was like, Oh my God, this place is awesome. You know, so I'm never leaving. And then, uh, yeah, I ended up meeting my wife here and yeah, I fell in love with her in the state and it's like, Nope, I'm done. I, I like it. I'm never leaving. So that's how I got here. That's funny, man. Uh, I know for me growing up, you know, I was born and raised here in Anchorage, but by the time I was 17, I was like, I just wanted to go anywhere out of Alaska. <laughs> you know, so I joined, I literally joined the military to get out of Alaska as fast as I could. Um, but you know, like you said, though, for me, when I was going back and forth between the army and Marines, I thought they were both pretty badass and I wasn't sure which one I was going to do. But when it came down to like contract time, the Marines, they couldn't offer like, well, we can't guarantee what your job's right. going to be. You're going to have to go through, you know, boot camp and then whatever the Marines need you, that's the, where they're going to put you. I'm like, or the army was like, here's your job. Like you choose which job you want, you know, based off your ASVAB score. And I was scored high enough in the ASVAB to pick whatever job I wanted. But at least I had a guaranteed like contract of what I was going to do for the next four years of my life. Yep. That, yeah. That's exactly what sold me on the army over the Marine Corps. Cause I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I've always thought that the, the dress uniforms for marines i mean i mean come on it's a that's a hot uniform it's the marines you know who run it's the marine corps pretty awesome but uh, yeah no the contract is ultimately what (laughs) what sealed the deal for the army yeah no kidding so how many years did you spend in the army oh gosh i was in just under seven i got out in november 2011 um yeah just under seven i did a uh iraq deployment 2006 to 2007 and then uh, an Afghanistan deployment, 2009 to 2010. Wow. Iraq and Afghanistan, both of those, huh? Yeah, both I got to go leaders. visit visit both wonderful places. <laughs> I don't know uh, <laughs> which one you would choose would be better, but did you have, prefer one over the other or just different? In either, in uh, man, no, they both had they both had their challenges. Um, if I had to go back to one of them, it would be Afghanistan. Yeah, just because... Uh, well, at that point, we're, we were running. Uh, well, I wasn't a private. Um, we didn't lose anybody in the, the company on that deployment. Um, so Afghanistan was definitely better than, yeah. than Iraq. Yeah. You still stay in contact with some of your old buddies? Uh, I got a few of them on Facebook. And then uh, the team I went with, we keep in touch. Uh, I've actually had, had a few of them come up and visit since, uh, since we've all been out. Um, it was kind of funny how we, you know, we were super close while we were in. And then as soon as... As soon as you separate, all of a sudden, you know, it's it's like a cockroaches when the light comes on and everybody just kind of scattered and you lose touch here and there and phone numbers change. And yeah. Yeah. So we, we kept in touch with the, I kept into just a number of them. I uh, recently been more uh, connecting with more and more of them. Uh, just kind of running into them at random locations and yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. No, man, that is funny. That's kind of how it was for me too. But I think that's just the way the military is set up. It's like you're in these super close, tight situations together for a long time. And then, you know, you exit the military and you go back to your regular civilian life and everybody just kind of goes off. And But it's pretty incredible. I mean, you just create so many great memories and you have this incredible bonded experience with these people. Sometimes, yeah. so one of my, my roommate from the military, uh, from the army, uh, we lived together for three years. Uh, I hadn't seen him in 20 years. He found me on Facebook. And as a matter of fact, he's an apprentice at the IBW in, uh, where's he at? He's in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, right on. Yeah. It was pretty funny. So we started talking, but it was, it was so funny. It's like, we haven't spoken in over 20 years and we just picked up right where we left off 20 years ago. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest trip. You can not talk to a guy for years and then you run into him and you start, you start talking and it's like, you just saw him yesterday. Yeah. It's pretty nuts. Except for they've got like wives and kids and you're all grown up and responsible adults now. And you're like, wow, things have changed, but it's still you. Hey, it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I know we started sharing some old stories about what, <laughs> what we were doing. <laughs> it seems like a lifetime ago though, man. You, you talk about some of those stories. I'm like, God, I was 19, 20 years old when I did. I can't believe I used to do that <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're like, mm, Couldn't get away with that now. Yeah. Yeah. So your journey through the military, how was, um, you know, I, for me, I had a kind of a hard time. It probably took me 
three or four years after I separated from the service to really kind of settle down into civilian life. Is is this a rough transition from military to civilian life? It is transitioning out is, is uh, not an easy task, you know. And there's there's a lot of uh, just trials and changes. You know, every, your whole life changes. You go from uh, like we're both talking about joining we're, we're teenagers. Um, you really don't know anything. Like, no offense, any teens that might be listening. You're like, we all thought we did. Um, and we're ready to take the, you know, the world by the horn, so to speak. Um, but you get everything told to you, you, you know, you know, you get told when you're, when you're going to wake up, what you're going to wear when you get there, what you need to have with you, what you're going to eat, like your whole day is planned out. And then your free time, you just kind of do whatever you want. You just go hog wild. Um, when you get out, well, that structure is gone. There's no more. You have to be here. You have to have this. You have to, that you're expected to know what those things are. And that's an added stress. Uh, and then on top of it, going through when you're in the military, you're still accumulating um, debt and your family and all that kind of stuff is still happening just as if you weren't in the military. The difference is that guaranteed every two weeks paycheck. And when that's gone, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um so did you, what were some of the, some of the challenges that you faced getting out? I know for me personally, it was like trying to find a freaking job. <laughs> I mean, I could find a lot of jobs to do, but none that I really satisfied me or I thought was really great. And like you said, too, is trying to have that, that, you know, steady income coming in too is challenging. And then, but just adjusting from civilian life, you know, to civilian life from military life, like you said, the structure that you get in the military is, you know, like you said, everything's planned out for you. When you come to civilian life, nothing is planned. It's like you're on your own, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a very different, uh, a very different uh, climate for sure. Um, the, the hardest part for me was when I was getting out, um, I didn't want to have any kids while we were doing our deployment cycles. Um, but when I came over from Afghanistan, my wife got pregnant with our first and, um, the military was nice enough to, to allow us to have my son on base, even though I was already uh, separated. Uh, they extended um, our medical for three months so that we could have him um, with our doctor and everybody who we had, we had gone through with. But um, as soon as he was born, and the, I think they covered a month or something like that. I don't, I don't know what the timeline is. But anyway, they, they took care of us up through, through his birth and a little bit afterwards. Um, but then there's no insurance. You know, insurance is gone. The free medical is gone. I'm going, oh. Now what do I do? And um, so here I was, you know, early, early twenties, mid twenties, uh, wife, newborn kid, going. How am I going to afford, you know, my car, rent, a baby? You know, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the baby costs it. You know, diapers and formula and all this other stuff. And you're like, oh my god! And it was really, uh, it was super stressful. And and I, I was one of those guys that I consider myself being set up. I had done all the transition stuff like I was supposed to. I attended all the classes. Um, I built all the resumes. I sent out all the emails. I applied to all the jobs. Um, and th there was still just nothing breaking free. The saving grace for me was that my wife's father, uh, my father-in-law, Marty, he happened to be an electrician in the IBW and said, hey, have you ever thought about construction? I'm like, well, yeah, it's the direction I think I want to go. And actually, I was like, I've had enough time in the uniform. I'm not interested in being a police officer. And then the idea of having to draw down on a, another American. I was like, no, thanks. I'll pass. Um, so I was like, hey, construction's where I want to go. He's like, whoever thought about joining the IBW? And I was like, no, man, the union, are you kidding? Like, I can't do that. Like, no way. I was born in a household where the union was a swear word. I had issues with the, my great granddad got hurt on the job. You know, he was a permanent hand back in the day before they necessarily brought in people as members. He got injured. Um, no, this, this was your grandfather. That's my great grandfather. Your great grandfather. So you're talking like early 1900s, then? Yeah, we're talking a, a, a good while. Yeah, about a yeah. hundred years ago, at least. Got a, about a hundred years ago. Yeah, he got he had a boiler blow up on him, and um, because he wasn't a member, he didn't. It, they just kind of dropped him. And the, my granddad was the oldest of ten kids. Had to kind of take over the father role and go earn a living for all of his brothers and sisters while trying to create his own life and. Uh, so he absolutely hated uh, unions. And so when, when my father and I was like, Hey, you should join the IBW. I've been raising a, uh, uh unions are a swear word and they're, they're bad. And you know, they hurt the family. Like we're the, the my family, the, the Kaisers were very, uh, it's all about family. And uh, so they were like, yeah, I don't do it. And well, I started looking into it more and more in a, 
the pay rates and the benefits. And he's like, do you really know what a union is? And I'm like, no, not really. And he's like, well, let me show you. And I went to like an IBW picnic and I got to meet all these other people that were all electricians and linemen and communication workers and stuff and, and their families. And, um, it kind of changed how I looked at them. So I applied, I went to, uh, I was actually accepted into the line apprenticeship program before I got out of the military. Um, I went through the apprenticeship, uh, the first year apprenticeship school prior to exiting. Um, but when I got out of the military, it was like right at the beginning of fall and all the work was winding up and nobody was putting in work calls. So now I was like, well, now what do I do? I've, I've set myself up to go have this job, but there's no work because it's getting ready to snow and everything's winding down. Um, so the, the money I thought I was going to be making, um, wasn't happening yet. So I was just filling in with any jobs I could here and there. And I mean, me, I can't tell you how many times I got turned down for just little jobs at that point. I just needed anything to, to even pay partial rent. My landlord, um, God bless him was really cool with working with us and he knew my situation. And, um, you know, he let me go for a couple months where I didn't have to pay rent, but, um, I was lucky. And, and, you know, I know, I had a pretty decent transition into comparatively speaking to a lot of the guys I know getting into the workforce. And, um, that's really what started all the stuff we're doing now is within the IBW. Cause I went through the apprenticeship. Um, I switched over to being a, a wireman. So I'm an electrician um, by trade. Uh, I got offered a job, uh, at the local hall here at, um, 1547 in Alaska as, uh, uh, an organizer doing membership development and, Initially, I was like, nah, I'll pass. I'm working as a foreman. I'm doing all right. I'm I'll, I'm good. And then um, my wife was actually the one that kind of was like, you know, you're constantly talking about how you think things can change and improve and this and that. And you, now you have a chance to go do something about it. and You're not going to take it. You should think about it. And so I interviewed. And- isn't, isn't always amazing how wives have that ability to uh, kind of point us in that direction? Oh, yeah. No, oh, she's been my sounding board since we've since i met her she's always been the, the rock for me to lean on but yeah that's pretty incredible yeah and she's like yeah you should you should interview so i did long story short it ended up working out and here i am and how long have you been with the ibw now oh boy uh what is it 2020 uh, nine years wow yeah nine years with the ibw and i've been, I've, been ha- I've had this job for just about three it'll be three years in october all right you know, one of the things I noticed when you were talking about uh, when you were learning about the IBW and, and working with the union, I had never thought about it. That thought had never crossed my mind for me personally. Uh, but then, you know, when Serena and I started dating, got married and she brought me to a couple of IBEW picnics, it really kind of had that military brotherhood kind of feel to it. It really reminded me of that um, that aspect. So, I mean, I see that there can almost be a natural transition there. Yeah, it, fit, it fits real well because it is. You, you get... Um, so that was one of the reasons that drew me to it was meeting all these people. But then what really, I'd say what really made me like a, a union brother, you know, I got a cough. <clears throat> uh, what really made me a union brother was that, uh, you know, I mentioned when I first got out, my, I was having a, a son and he was young. So I got my, finally got my first job call and he was like six weeks old. Um, and I couldn't have been on the job for more than a couple of weeks. And they're like, hey, yeah, uh, my, my grandma called and said my granddad uh, wasn't doing well back in Colorado. So I had to ask for time off to go back to Colorado. And I was like, oh, man, I'm going to get laid off. I'm not going to have a job. You know, I just started. I'm brand new into the trades. And um, long story short, none of that happened. I came back and and they had passed the hat. And, and so passing the hat on a job site, you know, they collect up money for for uh, brothers and sisters in need and they had heard about me being a brand new apprentice the fact that i was military and all this other stuff and, and they passed the hat and actually helped cover the cost um well more than cover the cost of the trip to go be with my family and at that point i was like oh man i'm oh i'll forever be a part of this and, that's incredible yeah and that's so that, that's really what sold me yeah and then uh, you know i loved i fell in love with it after that and then um I've been a, a diehard uh, union brother since. And then uh, when I got this job, I had. So what's, what's your title again now? So I'm the, I'm the lead organizer for local 1547 uh, for the state of Alaska. 
Okay. So what does that mean? What is your, what are your job duties as lead organizer? So my job duties are to work with contractors that are interested in becoming IBW um, to figure out what works for their business models, what doesn't work, how we can change it. Um, and in order to, uh, in order to make the, the relationship work and, and help them be profitable. Um, I also work with individuals and groups looking to gain representation through the IBW. If a group of workers wants to be represent the IBW, then I help them through that process as well. Um, if there's somebody that wants to be an electrician, um, I help them either point them in the direction of the apprenticeship, um, bring them in as a, a, a journeyman, uh, but that, that's what I do now. All right, friends, so we get to learn a little bit about who Kyle is, where he came from, and then that life-altering moment, witnessing 9-11 happen live on TV and prompting him to join the military, which set him down a path for the, sets the base of his future to come and his travel through the military and then coming out of the military, transitioning from military life to civilian life and some of the turbulent times that he had experienced. But then it also, we got to learn about how he became to be, become a member of an organization like the IBEW, even though his entire family was, were not huge union representatives growing up there. Um, we're going to take a quick break here and have a word from our sponsor, 907 Financial, and then we will learn more about the Viper program when we return. This episode of the Financial Tip Friday podcast is brought to you by 907 Financial, a financial literacy group dedicated to teaching you how to save for your future goals, invest like the pros, and build your wealth. The finance consultants at 907 Financial work with people in private one-on-one settings throughout the Financial Fitness Academy. Or for organizations and businesses, call and inquire about a group presentation for your team members. To learn more about 907 Financial and how they can help you or your organization, visit their website, www.907financial.com, or check out their Facebook page, 907 Financial LLC, where every two Tuesday, Travis Gillardi, Senior Finance Consultant, shares a financial tip that you can act on now. 907 Financial, Alaska's premier financial literacy group dedicated to help you find your financial freedom. Call today to schedule your free consultation at 907-231-0990. That's 907-231-0990. What are you waiting for? Your best financial self is just a phone call away. 907-231-0990. All right. Thank you so much, Nanosim Financial, for sponsoring this podcast and sponsoring this interview with Kyle Kaiser from the IBEW and Viper program. And I'd also like to give everybody out there who's listening a little update. On Wednesday, July 15th, uh, Travis Glardy, Senior Finance Consultant from Nanosim Financial, will be hosting a live webinar on student loan debt. So if you have student loan debt and you're trying to figure out how to get rid of it, or you're thinking about uh, incurring student loan debt, this is the webinar for you. So tune in live. It will be free platform to be announced. Um, But that's coming up on Wednesday, July 15th. Okay. Without further ado, let's listen to the second half of our interview with Kyle Kaiser and learn about the Viper program and how it, how he helps transition military service members from military life to civilian life. So you've created a program to kind of help, uh, help organize and get people to join the IBW through the military. Haven't you? Yes. We launched uh, um, VEEP, the veterans electrical entry program here locally um, through the IBW. And so the way, the way VEEP works is the last 180 days that you're in the military, um, you're allowed to attend um, training for your next career. So if you want to be, you know, like in this case, an electrician, you come to us and say, Hey, I want to be an electrician. We go, awesome. We do that. Um, where do you want to go? And they give us their top four spots that they want to uh, live in across the country. And we secure direct entry into the apprenticeship for them. Um, so really our JTCs, our training coordinators, they do all of the the hard work because um, they get applicants coming in and they go find them um, guaranteed spots uh, anywhere in the country. We have over 300 training centers. Um, and the training coordinators get that agreement set up. So once the agreement's set up, they attend a seven-week um, pre-apprenticeship class here locally before they get out. And then when they, they get out, the military moves them home, and their next career is waiting for them when they get there. Um, there's no more guessing, hey, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go work? How much am I going to make? What do my benefits look like? Um, it's all laid out black and white. And so that's that's how it all that's how everything got started here locally with the IBW was Veep. Um, and Veep came from 
one of the guys, or one of the reasons that, well, the reason Veep is here is I've been doing uh, this current job for a while and I called up one of my, uh, one of the guys we, we do a periodic, like once a year, we call each other just to, you know, have a catch up, say how you're doing. And uh, he asked me if I, I'll leave the guy's name out of it, if I had heard about one of our buddies that we deployed with. And I said, no, why, how's he doing? He said, oh, well, he, he killed himself. And I went, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Why? And long story short, he, uh, he, he couldn't afford medical bills for his kid. Um, had a hard time holding down employment. He had issues and um, went out in the woods and and that was that. And um, it really disturbed me. So I had to, then I sat back and looked at my own transition and everything. Like, yeah, there were some rough parts waiting for my first call. But then, you know, that, that lasted a month or two, three. And then when I got my first call, life totally changed. And I went, man, how can I have all the benefits and stuff that I have now but not these other guys. How do I make that available to them? And that's where I started digging. And I actually found V, but it had been proposed oh, like five or six years before we launched it here um, at a conference. Someone had come up with the idea and said, hey, we should we should do this. And there was a lot of head bobbing and yeah, we should, but nobody actually picked up and did anything with it. Um, so when I found it, you know, I had a newfound motivation. I was like, well, we're going to make this happen so that this, this doesn't happen. This, you know, we're going to end suicide this way. And so we started with electricians and it's been great. Um, but then I was a man, not everybody wants to be an electrician. So what more, how can I do more? Um, so I went to all the building trades unions here locally. I, I've known them all for years. And um, I said, Hey, I have this idea and I want you to do VEEP style programs within your locals, direct entry, direct hire for veterans and military spouses. And they said, okay, let's give it a shot. And I was like, that's so awesome. So what I did is I created, um, I started a nonprofit called Viper, uh, Veteran Internships Providing Employment Readiness. And what Viper does. When, uh, so when did you start Viper? Viper, we started, oh, let's see. Well, we officially, we officially started about a year ago. We got our, our IRS designation, all that stuff about four months ago. Um, but we started doing doing the work about about a year ago, and um, what we do is with the same style process of within that 180 days, getting you hooked up with your direct entry and your training, you know, getting your contract. Um, but I took Viper, so I went to all the building and construction trades, and I was like, well, let's do construction first because I know all the construction people, and so we did construction, and I'm like, great. Now we need to take this to more. Um, so then I went and I met. Um, you know, with Troy Jarvis down here at uh, Lith- Lithia. Uh, Lithia. Yeah, yeah. And told him about the program. And he was like, dude, I'm all for it. They already had like good sale deals and stuff for vets. And he was like, man, I would love it because we're trying to get mechanics and we're working with UAA on an apprenticeship program and this and that. And I was like, well, sweet. We should partner. So he actually, he sponsors the the Viper truck that I drive around. Oh, super cool. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, cool, man. Th- this will work. So we send... So now when we go to talk to transitioning soldiers and military spouses, we can offer them, you know, building trades plus mechanics and salesman jobs at Lithia. And then I went, this is great. Let's see how much more we can do. So now we're partnering and working with, uh, I use partnering loosely because I know there's legal ramifications with partnering, but we're working with FedEx and uh, Southwest Airlines, um, which is actually hilarious because they're not in Alaska, <laughs> but yeah. But uh, we're working with them on doing uh, airframe and power plant technicians as well as pilots. Um, and it's just, it's it, one thing after another keeps happening with, uh, with Viper. And the whole goal is to end. So when you start talking veteran suicide, there's a couple of things that uh, all of them, I shouldn't say all of them, most of them have in common. And it's unemployment, underemployment, alcohol and drug abuse. And those, the alcohol and drug abuse can usually stem from something going on at work. And not being able to provide that. that. And, you know, sorry to interrupt you on that, but that's, no, go for it. that is the exact um, reason why I started my financial wellness program. It's because uh, uh, financial anxiety is actually the number two cause of suicide right behind clinical depression over the last 15 years. And uh, a lot of that stems from, you know, your employment, where you work, if you can get a job. Uh, and and then on top of that, yeah, drug and alcohol abuse is is you know the way people cope with financial anxiety and things like that. So 
that's the exact reason why I started my financial wellness program to help combat that. Yeah. And and that's, and that's why I wanted to talk to you about Viper. Cause that's the, that's the whole thing is we're doing it, we're, It's such a different approach to transitions. Like it, when I first started talking about it and looking at it, I went, man, this has to happen somewhere else in the country. Somebody else already has to be doing this. And there's, there's a, a couple other spots that do the, the employment piece. Um, not the way we do it. Like our, our partners, uh, union, non-union, I got to stress that a, a bunch because um, Viper is to help put people to work and to help put veterans to work, whether you're a union shop, a non-union shop, it doesn't matter. That's why it's a nonprofit. So I can partner with as many groups as we can. Um, the one caveat to that is you will sign an agreement with the person entering into the program. So if you're going to hire somebody as an AMP technician, um, you're going to spell it out black and white and sign an agreement with that veteran or military spouse that lays out how much they're going to make, what their benefits look like, what their health care looks like, so that they can actually have a plan moving forward, knowing that, hey, when I go to work, this is what my budget's going to look like. This is where I'm going to be working. This is where I'm going to live. And you can actually have you know, you, the, that stability, knowing, hey, this is you know, two plus two equals four, and I'll be set. Um, that's a big piece of it. And, then we, and our outreach programs that we're developing are... <laughs> nobody else does it this way. So part of the, the issue I had with transition was the death by PowerPoint in a classroom. You know, it's, you sit there and you're like literally trying not to fall asleep. And, you, you know, you, and when I was going through it, I felt bad. Cause I'm like, I'm ready to fall asleep and just start sawing logs right there in the chair. But in my head, I'm going, I need to pay attention to all this. Cause I know I'm going to need to know it. So I'm trying to not be distracted and fall asleep and get the information. It just, it was a challenge, you know, maybe I have a little bit of ADD, but you know, it's like, it was tough. And so what I did is our outreach programs are different in that we focus them on out, outside events. You know, we're doing operation combat pike. Uh, so we, Alaska has a big invasive pike problem. So what we're doing is we're taking veterans and military spouses fishing for invasive pike. And then while you're on the bus ride or, or plane ride to go fish, we're talking to you about your career. It's like, well, hey, what are you really going to do? What's your plan look like? Because now you're not focused on sitting there in this classroom. You're out kind of having a good time. You're a little bit more relaxed. And then they start asking real questions. And when you can get when you can get these guys and gals away from the 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 installation, literally the 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 military installation, to start talking to them about what their plans are, and you make it more individualized and personal. It's amazing how much more they'll open up. Uh, you know. Pride is a huge thing in the military. Your unit pride, your your branch pride, your individual pride, it's huge. You're not going to ask questions in a group full of 40 or 50 peers and and have yourself appear like you don't know what's up or you're not geared to go, you know, like fake it till you make it is kind of the motto. <laughs> Even if, you know, the, the worst decision you can make as a leader was to not make a decision. So you're taught from the very beginning, <clears throat> even if it's not the right one, I'm making a decision and going for it. And that you don't lose that when you go to get out. Um, so when you yeah. can separate them from that kind of a cultural environment, they they open up more. And yeah. so that's what our, our operation combat pike. And then we have Fish Den 22. We're, we're talking to uh, uh, local fishing charters here to have uh, charter seats available to take transitioning members out charter fishing. Hey, while you're out, you know, getting your halibut and salmon, what are you going to do for a living? And then. Fish Den 22 is actually, it's actually running up. Uh, so this is why Viper's so nuts. It's all this network of who you happen to run into and know. Um, my buddy Scott Heisey lives uh, like 30 minutes outside of DC. And he's a, he's got his 100, 100 ton uh, master boat captain license. And uh, he's running Fish Den 22 on the East Coast. And he's taking people fishing on the East Coast and talking to him about careers. So we actually get people from all over the country now asking about um, the program and how they can get into it and how their companies can partner with us. And, and um, yeah, man, it's just, it's going nuts. That's great. So, so if a company is interested and wants to be, wants to partner with Viper or work with Viper, uh, they don't have to organize as a union. This is not a union program, right? This is to help put vets to work, transitioning vets to work. Correct. Yeah. They don't have to be, they do not have to be a union program. Um, obviously those options are always open, but no, they do not have to be a, a union program. They're going to be required to, to put, um, pen to paper to make sure people are taken care of. Um, 
But yeah, no, that was the whole idea with the the nonprofit. Like we're 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 definitely union backed. You know, the, the IBW is all over it, and the building trades unions are all over it. Um, you know, they're they're my main sponsors, and they they support support everything we're doing. But yeah, no, it's open. Uh, it's open to everybody by design. Um, the more avenues people have to take, the better. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, you got any good success stories from people uh, transitioning from the military and taking advantage of the Viper program? Um, well, we've got, we've done two cohorts of the electricians. So we've just had their second class. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. Uh, what's, can you, can you describe what the cohort is then? Yeah. So when we, um, I work with the different, uh, training coordinators, uh, for the, all, all the unions and the IBW with their V program, they put on however many classes that they've decided to put on in, in a calendar year, um, set up for V candidates. And like, we just had one graduate here in a month ago, two months ago. What are we in June? Gosh, probably a couple months ago now. All blurred together these last few. Um, and uh, so we took in 15, I believe, was last this last class. So we put in, we brought in about 30 electricians uh, through the through the program in the last uh, two classes that have gone on. We're supposed to be hosting another one here, I believe, in September. And then um, the recent developments with Viper has been the iron workers. Um, they are going through all of their apprenticeship standards and making it so that uh, they can take Viber cannons across the, the the Northwest Northwest district. So that'll be happening this fall as well. Oh, very cool. And then locally the building and construction trades are open during their application periods that we can um, send people their way as well. Very cool. So uh, what's part of the training in the Viper cohort then? What, what do you guys cover? So they, in the, during that, the, um, uh, so during that training, you essentially you'll go to your pre-apprenticeship. So it's it, it it's like the iron workers isn't quite their full first year's apprenticeship class curriculum. It's pretty close. Um, it's enough to put you on the job and get you working, and then they can fill in the, the blanks whenever or fill in the gaps whenever you get uh, get where you're going. Um, the IBW is the same way as far as um, the training. It's a seven week seven week program. They go through seven weeks of uh, hands on and classroom training uh here in alaska um and uh the one thing i want, I, I do have to make sure i get this out there too about um, viper and beep in these programs is um they don't cost the veteran or military spouse anything oh that's good to know it's all um privately sponsored funded um money milwaukee tools um sponsors the electrician program beep oh very cool so it doesn't cost it doesn't cost the veteran it doesn't cost um the local uh, the JTC. Uh, you know, minimal amounts to, to host, to host the classes. Um, Cause that was the other thing with, with starting Viper. It's like, man, I gotta have, I gotta have a way to put more people into it. Cause ultimately, you know, we'd be a realist. Uh, it comes down to dollars and cents. Uh, anytime you have the greatest idea in the world and an awesome program, but if you don't got the dollars and cents added up to make it work, it's not going anywhere. You'll get a lot of, yeah, that's a great idea, but I don't see it happening. So with Milwaukee taking care of the electricians and then IBW taking point on, on, with Veep and doing that, um, Viper was, it was created to help all these other groups out that that might not be able to afford or have the connections to do that. Um, so when we go do fundraising, and that's why as a, as a nonprofit you can you can donate to it. And what we do is we sponsor people through those classes. So if, if uh, I'll use the Ironworkers, they want to put on a class between um, grants that they can get as an organization, um, and then sponsors from viper we can help offset costs so that it's still free to the veteran military spouse one of the big things that i refuse to do is be one of those programs that um charges uh you your gi bill uh for a pre-apprenticeship um in my mind that's that's just crooked thievery but it's just there's no reason for it i want you to use your gi bill to boost your 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 uh, career you know it shouldn't be what you have to use to get into one so the whole goal is that if you use it while you're on the job, so you can use your GI Bill while you're at an apprentice, right? To offset, um, you know, whatever you're making in the military versus what you're making on the job. And I did that and I'm okay with, with people who choose to do that. But if you choose not to, and just um, do the apprenticeship and get paid uh, your normal wages and then save your GI Bill, the idea is to be able to do that and then save it. If you want to become like, I don't know, an estimator or project manager or start your own shop and you want to go back to school for business management. Well, now you've gone through a program from the ground up, starting out as a brand new first year apprentice, journeyed out, and now you can go back and go, hey, you know what? I think I, I want to start my own shop. Well, now you can go back to school and take your classes to get your degree 
because now it's focused. You know, eighty-eight percent of vets that go to college when they first get out uh, fail and drop out of the uh, drop out of college, and then they're seven times more likely to commit suicide than vets that never went to college. Not right. that I'm knocking college; it works great for some people. I get people like, ah, oh, I'm not saying that, but statistically, uh, that's that's the reality of it. Yeah, most of us don't make it through college, and and then that's the whole new stressor because you just use your benefits on something that you failed out of, and now you you just failed and that you don't know how to handle that and that whole whole another mental side of it and man actually i did not uh i've never heard that statistic i didn't know about that um that kind of blows my mind i well for me i use my gi bill when i get out of the military and went to college uh i was kind of in a lucky scenario though i guess because i had the in-state tuition here at uaa and the gi bill and then I'm Alaska Native, so I had some Alaska Native scholarships. And then I was working for FedEx at the time, and they have a great tuition reimbursement program. So I ended up spending eight years in college, but I changed my major four different times. And I was <laughs> I was making like three to four thousand dollars a month to go to school. So I was like in a really unique position. And I finally got to the point where I was like, all right, I'm going to have to grow up and graduate at some point. And that was like the hardest part for me. I was like getting, actually getting out of college with a degree just because I was having so much fun studying. And, and, you know, also God, when I was in high school, man, I put little to no effort in my schoolwork. And I think I graduated with like a 2.3, 2.4 GPA. But when I went to college, I graduated college with a 3.8 GPA. I mean, like I was just much more focused. I think, and I attribute that to my military experience too. So, but I had actually never heard that statistic that you were mentioning before, and it does make sense. So, yeah, because I, I think it's a lot of it has to do with having no no focus. You're not real sure. It's just kind of a oh, that's what everybody does. So that's what I'm going to do. But then they're not the the motivation and focus aren't there to actually make it work. Um, yeah, and that's just it's the way it is. And so if we can help point them. Um, well, cause like a lot of guys, part of the conversations I have with them is, you know, I'm going to go out and go to college. Great. What are you going to do? Well, I don't know. Okay. Can you afford, you know, your family, your house, your cars with your GI bill and whatever other money you have set aside, but you know, how are you going to, what's your income going to look like? And you actually have to have those conversations with them. Cause I know like when I was getting out, a lot of people, including myself, were sitting there just, man, I can't wait to get out. You know, uh, I get to take this uniform off and nobody gets to tell me what to do anymore. And you, you know, people are just anxious to get out and be quote unquote free. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with that freedom. And, uh, it's making sure that they're prepared for that regardless of what the choice is. Um, this Avenue, you know, we, we set it up to present, uh, direct employment opportunities and, and direct enrollment opportunities um, for quality careers, places yeah. that have, you know, what you're getting. Um, and you're not guessing now if you want to go back and supplement that and take classes while you're working rock on yeah but it shouldn't have to be a, a yeah we're not going after gi bills that's a big that's a big pet peeve of mine because there is all sorts of places that offer you the world if you give them sign over that gi bill to them <sighs> yeah and it's like nope you can't let that happen hang on to that so if you want to go to school you can use it but yeah yeah, yeah. guard that thing yeah absolutely so what do you see what does the future for viper look like Oh gosh, the future for Viper. I'm working with uh, DOD and stuff on getting uh, memorandums of understanding to go and do presentations at um, all the the transitions offices and whatnot. Uh, one of the big pushes and focuses I have right now is uh, working with the guard more uh, to make sure that the the local the local uh, guardsmen and women and their families have opportunities. Um, you know, they they they're another uh, very high risk demographic when it comes to veteran suicide um a lot of people don't know that but um, national guard are leading the leading the, the charts on that one um and then i really we really focus so we're really focused on guard uh, and spouses military spouses are hardly ever talked about when it comes to and they carry like the burden like Oh for God. I don't know any military guy who would have made it who couldn't have made it through the military without having a good strong spouse there to help support you know that that family unit. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, my 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 wife's getting a, a free admittance into heaven for putting up with me for all these years, man. It's a that's there's no doubt about it. And and, and the sad truth is, is that they go unemployed a lot. Um, 
And it's mostly due to the fact that they're, they're going to PCS and move, you know, so you might be at a duty station for two, like here it's three years. Um, some employers aren't interested in hiring you because they figure it's going to take them about a year to get you to where the, you want them. And then if you're only a two year station and moving, well, you're going to work for me for about six months and then you're going to have to go pack up your house and leave. So I'm going to spend a year getting you where I need you to be. And then you're going to leave. So they just, you know, get hired. Um, so what we're doing with our network and, and creating our program is to have it to where that spouse can just transfer wherever they are around the country, but still have the trainings and credentials uh, to follow their service member around and have employment wherever that place is at and have their own careers in addition to uh, the service member. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that'd be a great opportunity to grow the program. I can totally see that happening, expanding. Yep. Garden spouses. Those are our big pushes. And then our outreach programs, we're really, we're really making a push to get the uh, operation combat pike up and launching. All right. Fantastic. So if somebody was interested in working with Viper, how would they get a hold of you or who would they contact? Uh, so right now we're on Facebook and, and they can do Facebook messaging here within the, the week. We'll be putting up our, uh, our website. So it'll be vipertransitions.com um, will be our website. Um, it's not launched and functioning yet, but it's coming up here this week. Fantastic. All right. Any third parting thoughts or words you'd like to share? Um, yeah, if you're not sure what you're going to do when you get out, uh, ask people who have already gotten out, lean on, lean on that network. Um, do, do pay attention when you're in transitions class and your tab class and, uh, create your social media accounts and all the stuff you're going to hear when you're there, you know, uh, make sure your emails are professional. They're not some weird name. Know your audience when you're talking to, um, possible future employers and whatnot. Um, and thank you for your service. But just remember when you get out, you're just like everyone else. Nobody's going to owe you anything. And uh, your your discounts at, at drive throughs goes away too. So um, I just saying, you know, be prepared for that harsh reality, man. There's, there's a lot of these guys that think they get out. And, no, man, um, you ain't going to get a whole lot of, you know, thank you for your services where it's going to end. Nobody's going to give you any handouts. So you need to, be prepared to go fight for it. <laughs> Truer words have never been spoken, man. <laughs> True <laughs> words have never been spoken, that's for sure. Well, all right, uh, Kyle, really appreciate all your time uh, and sharing um, what you're doing with Viper. I think it's a fantastic project and I'm really excited to be, you know, help out wherever I can and be a part of it too. So thanks a lot for that opportunity. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I look forward to working with you on it. All right. All right, friends. So that was my interview with Kyle Kaiser from the IBEW and Viper program. A great opportunity for transitioning service members to become a part of to help smooth over that transition from the military world to civilian life. And for all my business owner friends out there who are listening, and as you begin to reopen your businesses coming out of this global pandemic that we're in, you know, the big thing is, is staffing, right? And so if you're looking for good qualified candidates to help fill some of your positions, well, what better candidates could you hire than an, an ex-service member? Somebody who's got a, a work ethic, they know about team camaraderie, they can take orders, they can give orders, they can make decisions. There is literally no better candidate pool than to pull from them from ex-service members. So if you're a business owner, man, Get in contact with Kyle. Check out the Viper program. See what you can do to help partner with Viper and uh, fill up and staff your team with some great, hardworking individuals. Well, that brings the conclusion to this week's episode of the 907 Financial Tip Friday podcast and the 907 Spotlight. Tune in to next week's episode when I will be talking about missing money in a sheetment. It's a real thing out there, friends. And I guarantee you somebody out there who's listening has missing money and I'll tell you how to find it and how you can retrieve it. Also remember Wednesday, July 15th, live webinar at 6 p.m. Platform to be announced that will be coming up soon. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode and we'll talk soon.